Thank you for joining us at our regular employment update. Um, I'm Mandy Laurie, Head of the Employment Team, and I'm joined here today by my partner, Jen Skiok, who will be providing an update on significant cases in the areas of restrictive covenants, redundancy and discrimination law. So if you joined the wrong session, you can leave now. Um, I'm also pleased to be joined by Rebecca Ablett, a specialist in our IP litigation team, and also our very own Laura Fitzpatrick. And they'll be taking you through our top 10 tips on intellectual property and confidentiality issues. And finally, we'll take a look at what's happening in the news, which may have an impact on your business, and most notably, the potential changes to employment law post-Brexit. Now, I'm going to pass you over to Rebecca and Laura to take you through the top 10 tips. So over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mandy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Mandy mentioned, I'm a senior solicitor in our contentious IP and tech team. So one of the areas in which our team has seen a real growth over the last sort of five years or so is the insider threat. That is employees, consultants, contractors, or really any third party with access misappropriating their employer's IP and confidential information. Now, this is a huge issue which has become even more pertinent for all businesses, again, to backdrop of so many employees now working from home. And I know from discussions with Laura and other members of our employment team that this is a big concern for employers. So with that in mind, we've prepared our top 10 tips to protect your IP and confidential information in the workplace. So tip one is to identify and keep track of your IP and confidential information. Now, I appreciate that might sound like a rather obvious recommendation, but understanding what IP you have within your business is vital to protecting it. As a business, you should know where your IP and confidential information is located, whether this is in electronic or physical form. And on that basis, we regularly advise clients to conduct an audit and compile an IP and confidential information register. That register should be accessible by designated people within your workforce and should be reviewed and updated on a regular basis. Once you've identified your business IP, you can then consider what steps you need to take to ensure it's properly protected and not at risk of being exploited by others. So moving on to the second point, that is to safeguard and restrict access to confidential information. So if confidential information is not kept confidential, there's a risk that it will lose its confidentiality status. Once information is in the public domain, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for it to be considered confidential again. And for that reason, another important action is to safeguard and restrict access to your business's confidential information. You should ensure that your IT system has suitable divisions in it so that information is available on a need-to-know basis only. We recommend that you clearly mark all confidential information as being so, and more sensitive confidential information should be password protected. What this does is it helps defeat an argument that an employee or a contractor didn't know that the document or information in question was confidential. Another protective measure is to implement a categorization of documents where any documents over a certain category are flagged and special authorization is needed to send these out with the company network. If any of these documents are sent out with the company network without authorization, this will then automatically trigger an investigation which will help organizations such as yourselves act quickly in the event of a breach. So following on from Rebecca's latest tip, um, the next point that we would recommend is that you ensure that your internal IT security protocols are adequate and that necessary encryption and access controls are in place across your organisations. This is particularly important on devices which can be taken outside of the workplace. So on this, we would recommend that your workforce are properly educated and up to speed about password protecting documents, password protecting their devices, and using the appropriate and secure access routes and software that your business has in place. So for example, VPNs, et cetera. This is obviously particularly important when so many people are working remotely. Um, you know, and we're aware that the number of data breaches, hacks and phishing exercises since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic is pretty significant. So we would really recommend that you're making your employees aware 
of what they need to do in the event of data breach concerns or security issues, you know, to make sure that they're as alert as ever. On a related note about policies and procedures, we would recommend that you are reviewing your existing confidentiality procedures and policies to ensure that they're adequate and would stand up to test, whether these are contained within your employee handbook or otherwise. As Becca has touched on, we'd recommend that you're properly restricting access, marking documents as confidential, and ensuring that people know what information they should have access to. For completeness on this, you might want to request that key individuals within your organisation sign an acknowledgement confirming that they have read and understood these policies and procedures. On a related note, we would also suggest that you're updating your existing ER policies, e.g. disciplinary procedures, to make appropriate provisions with regards to confidentiality and what will happen in the event that these procedures are breached by an individual within the organisation. So our next recommendation is all about educating your workforce and that's about IP, how it can be protected and the consequences if it's compromised, whether that be intentionally or unintentionally. So can't stress enough how important employee awareness is when it comes to protecting your IP and confidential information. So some, some examples of how you can do that include Firstly, providing regular training. This can be from both internal and external sources and ensure that that is part of your new start induction process. Um, we're often asked to run training sessions for clients following a, um, following a data breach. And I know from training that we've had recently as a firm that the ICO actually ask our firm to run yearly training on the protection of information at work, um, you know, to get the key points out there for all the employees. Secondly, providing a letter to all new starts, informing them that they are instructed not to bring with them any material which may contain IP from any third party, and that includes former employers. So often there's such a focus on departing employees that the risks associated with new starts is forgotten or perhaps not prioritised. And clearly you do not want to find your organisation on the receiving end of legal action as a result of information which a new employee may have brought from their former employer. Thirdly, ensure that IP protection policies such as confidential information and IT security are in place and regularly updated. And I know that's something that Laura's just touched on. Um, again, this is something which makes a huge difference when it comes to enforcement action, as they can defeat any argument that the individual in question perhaps didn't know that the information was confidential or that they were not allowed to take it out with the workplace. So another recommendation is to monitor and document compliance with internal IP protection policies, including whether or not employees can send documents to personal email addresses to work when out of the office. When we're instructed in matters involving the misappropriation of an employer's confidential information or IP, it's amazing how often the employees in question claim that they need to do this to work from home. So again, having robust policies in place helps prevent that argument. Next, ensure policies in the event of non-compliance and sorry, enforce policies in the event of non-compliance and ensure that your workforce are aware of the enforcement options that are open to you. So it's incredibly important that your workforce are aware of the consequences if your IP is compromised by them and indeed when any enforcement action is actually taken. Finally, use signs around the workplace to inform staff of the rules and policies in place. Again, all of these kind of recommendations are all about raising awareness. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, the next tip is quite a you know, key one. It's just to ensure that your employment contracts contain robust provisions in relation to both intellectual property and confidentiality. These clauses should cover the position both during the course of employment and post termination. Um, we'd always recommend that where an employee is particularly senior or has access to a high volume of confidential information or creates IP as part of their role, that these clauses are properly tailored within the employment contract um, to really you know, strengthen the protection that's available to the business. On that note as well, the next tip is just to ensure that 
your contracts transfer the ownership of IP created in the course of employment. Um, so just a case of going through your contracts to make sure that you have that appropriate provision in place. Rebecca touched on the importance of monitoring the position at the beginning of an employment relationship. Our next tip just relates to what to do on exit. So we would recommend that you confirm with departing employees that IP and confidential information has not been removed. You can do this by asking your employees to sign a letter acknowledging that they've not removed any material containing the company's IP or confidential information during the course of their employment. And I know from working with Rebecca's team on matters like this, that having that letter can be quite a useful tool um, and can help in the event that you do need to take enforcement action. Thanks, Laura. Um... So our sort of penultimate tip is to be alert to the possibility of registering your IP as soon as practically possible. So different types of IP have different requirements in terms of registration, protection and enforcement. For example, trademarks are only enforceable once they've been registered with the IPO, whereas copyright protection arises automatically. So for that reason, it's always advisable to register your IP if possible. Doing so will put your business in a much stronger position when it comes to protection and enforcement of the IP. So taking trademarks as an example, registered trademarks give the owner a monopoly on use of the trademark in relation to the goods or services for which it's registered. And not only that, but it also gives the owner the right to stop others from using confusingly similar marks for their goods or services. And I should appreciate this can be an incredibly powerful tool when it comes to putting a stop to sort of copycat businesses or brands. And in the absence of a registered trademark, a business would require to rely on the law of passing off, which requires additional criteria to be met and can make enforcement a bit more difficult. And our final tip is to review confidentiality clauses in contracts with third parties, such as contractors, customers and suppliers, and to track the flow of confidential information to third parties. So this can either be done manually using a nominated gatekeeper or using companies such as Zonefox. And what this means is that you'll be instantly alerted to anomalous activities and can address the issue at that stage rather than further down the line when the damage may have already been done. So again, it's all about timescales and reacting quickly in the event of a, a breach of your confidential information or IP. So that concludes our you know, kind of whistle stop tour through our top 10 tips to protect your IP and confidential information. Um, if anyone has got any questions or any follow up points, please do let us know. Thanks very much, Laura and Rebecca. That was very informative. And now hopefully over to the West to our reporter, James Skiok, who had a power cut just before we joined. Our social edges, I think our new puppy may have chewed through a cable. <laughs> it's the more likely answer. But Jen, are you all set to go and give us a I'm case here. of crazy? <laughs> I'm here. Those of you who have attended other webinars um, at which I've spoken will know that I like to bring the drama and today <laughs> is uh, the same. So yeah, just as we all uh, logged on, we had a power cut. Um, so, but anyway, it's back on. The puppy has been put in the spare room. So if you hear any howling or barking, it is not me. Because <laughs> I don't know, um, I can't remember the facts of the case. It is my puppy who is a uh, three months old and very much um, an active member of the team at the moment. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, thanks again to Rebecca and Laura. That was really, really useful. And actually, one of the cases that I'm going to go on to mention um, sort of emphasises just the the interplay between confidential information and um, general employment law principles. Uh, the first case that I want to look at um, is a case of a Barclay Catering Limited against Jackson. Um, it's an employment appeal tribunal decision, which uh, we thought was quite an interesting one. Um, because it relates to redundancies, um, which I know is something that a lot of employers um, are looking at at the moment. And um, I mean, the, the position on redundancy law 
uh, has been quite settled for a number of years, but um, we thought it was quite an interesting case because uh, something about the facts of it jarred with us and I'm uh, interested to hear um, what your instinctive view on it is as, as well. But um, in this case, um, there was a woman called Mrs Jackson who had been employed um, by the, the respondent for um, about two or three years. Um, she had been recruited by the owner of the business um, to undertake the role of managing director. Um, and then about a year um, into her um, tenure, the owner effectively decided um, that they were going to start um, taking on some of her responsibilities themselves. Um, and I think the um, I think the bottom line was that uh, there were alleged personality and performance issues, but ultimately the owner decided. Um, they they wanted to part ways. I think that became very clear, and uh, so they started doing the duties of the MD, disparaging her um, in terms of the way he was talking about her, really undermining her in the conduct of her duties, and ultimately it all kind of reached ahead where he then said, "Do you know what your role is um, going to be made redundant, and I'm going to take on the role of CEO." Um, so there was a sort of quasi process followed, which involved um, the claimant being given notice of being at risk. Um, she attended a meeting um, in relation to potential alternatives. But I think from her perspective, it was all seen as a bit of a sham um, and that it had been engineered. Um, so ultimately, it went to the Employment Tribunal. She claimed unfair dismissal and said that there hadn't been a genuine redundancy situation because effectively um, the owner of the business had just um, had engineered it and sort of taken on her responsibilities, called himself the CEO and deleted the role of MD. Um, the, the tribunal accepted um, that and what they focused on was this question of was there a genuine redundancy? They said no, there wasn't a genuine redundancy um, and that it, it was unfair and because they had found it wasn't a genuine redundancy, they didn't really need to deal with the questions around procedure. Um, so it went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and quite a, at first sight it's quite a surprising decision. They overturned the Employment Tribunal decision and said no, there was a redundancy situation, you got that wrong and very emphatically said you need to be quite strict and look at the terms of the statutory test regardless of what drives the redundancy situation or what the motivation is. Um, and the statutory test, as you'll all be familiar with, is that if work um, employees doing work of a particular kind if the need for that has reduced. Um, now that can arise in a workplace closure situation which is a very obvious one or it can arise where you as an employer effectively um, have a drop in work or where you reorganise work. Um, and what the EAT said is you know, actually there can technically be a redundancy situation where you've got the same amount of work to be done but you just decide you only need one employee to do that work instead of two employees. So what the Employment Tribunal had focused on was there was still the same work to be done, there was still the same kind of management responsibilities and this guy had just come in and taken it, called himself the CEO and, and deleted the role of MD. And they, they felt that went to the genuineness of the redundancy situation. Um, but the EAT disagreed and said, no, the statutory test has been met. You know, there might be bad faith going on in the background. And I think, you know, you read the facts of this case and you're kind of like, that was that was bad faith. Definitely. <laughs> you know, he just decided he was going to take the job for himself and call himself the CEO. So what what I was struggling with the, with this decision was, well, that doesn't feel fair. That doesn't feel like an outcome we would all be expecting in the employment tribunal but what the EAT very carefully said is that's that's literally just hurdle number one 
in terms of the employer um, mounting a defence. So, yeah, there was a redundancy situation there because there was a reduced requirement, whatever the reasons are, whether you disagree or not, there was a reduced requirement for the role of managing director. So that's redundancy situation test satisfied. But the next question is, was redundancy the real reason for dismissal in that situation? And I think that's when the evidence about um, the kind of bad faith or the, the bad motivation um, behind that that process can come in and you if you were acting for the claimant could say um, he just, there was personality clashes it wasn't because of a redundancy situation it was it, it was for another reason and that's not a potentially fair reason um, and even if you got over that hurdle there would still be the general fairness test wouldn't there would still be up to the tribunal to say did that feel like it was a reasonable dismissal um, in all of the circumstances and you know, I think they would have had difficulties with the process that they followed there as well. Um, there was no appeal, interestingly, um, and they recruited someone in a senior position very shortly after the MD had um, been made redundant as well. So it's been remitted back to the employment tribunal effectively to hear all of those issues. And, and I suspect um, the employer will face significant difficulty winning um, all the other grounds that they need to win um, once it goes back there, unless it, it settles, of course. So um, quite quite an interesting one, I think helpful from an employer's perspective that you do have the comfort that, you know, as a business, you have the right to organise your your structure and your people teams in, in exactly the way that you think is right for your business. And if that results in a redundancy situation, then yes, you can um, go through a process. Um, but I think don't, um, you know, don't let that, I guess, give managers too much comfort on that front, because if there is any element um, of bad faith or that it's been sort of reverse engineered, um, then I think the tribunal will still be allowed to look behind that. Um, I suppose, Jen, that's kind of an extension to an acceptance by the courts that they will not look behind a bad business decision. So you as a business can make decisions that other people outside might say, why did they do that? So, mm -hmm. for example, Marks and Spencers could decide to no longer uh, have their food hall. Now, we might yeah. say, well, that's yeah. the most uh, profitable part of their business. And the tribunal is not going to look behind that unless they feel that there was some ulterior motive that could prove discriminatory, unlikely to be in such a big decision. But if it's only involving the one individual, then that's obviously going to be more problematic. Is that is that what you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I think what happened at the employment tribunal process at the employment tribunal stages they just didn't like they didn't like the way it came about and so they sort of combined or conflated the two tests was there a redundancy situation and was that the real reason um and so it's kind of a technical error on the tribunal's part but i, I do suspect um they would be struggling um to justify that so um interesting reminder i guess on on the redundancy um, statutory test and the way the tribunal will deal with that. Um, the next case I wanted to look at is one called Quilter Private Client Advisors against Faulkner and another. So this is the one that I was mentioning which related to confidential information and um, indeed post-termination restrictions. I, um, I won't ask you to do a show of hands, but I'm sure if any of you have asked uh, lawyers to help you on restrictive covenant drafting, you'll probably have been hitting your head against the wall or uh, banging your fists on the keyboard because what we always say is we really need to know exactly the type of rule that we're talking about. It needs to be tailored. Um, there's, you know, really very, it's, it's, it's very risky to go with a generic contract of employment on restrictive covenants for all of your workforce because the bottom line on restrictive covenants is that um, the, the courts will say um, this is unlawful um, as a restraint of trade. So you're stopping someone earning a living um, unless you can demonstrate to us that you have a legitimate business interest to protect. So again, going back to what uh, Rebecca and Laura were talking about, 
and crucially that the restrictive covenant goes no further than is absolutely necessary to protect that interest. So um, those of you who've worked on restricting restrictive covenants will know the kind of things that we're looking at are, um, you know, how how wide in duration is the covenant? So how long does it last for? Um, how narrow is it in terms of its geographical scope? Um, if you're looking to stop individuals from working in a particular sector, have you named the businesses that you're concerned about or is it just a sort of general um, restriction? So moving on to the facts of this case, this was a, a a business of financial advisors and they, they took on an employee um, and her employment contract contained a probationary period during which she could be dismissed on two weeks notice um, and she could leave on two weeks notice um, but interestingly then contained um, a nine month non-compete restrictive covenant um, which effectively means she couldn't work for a competitor of her employer for a period of nine months after her employment terminated and a 12 month non solicitation of clients and a 12 month um, non dealing with clients. So I wonder if you can see where, where this one's going when you look at the um, the probationary period um, and the notice period at the start and then the length of the restrictive covenants. They are lengthy restrictive covenants on the face of it and you know, we would always say once you're getting into the territory of nine to 12 months, um, that is really at the top end of what a court would be comfortable with um, in terms of restrictive covenants. And really, you'd be looking at, you know, the most senior individual within a business. Um, ultimately, she, she did leave during her probationary period. Um, she went to work as a self-employed contractor um, at a, a competitor. She was placed on garden leave for the duration of her notice period and an interim, interim injunction was sought um, to stop her from going to work there and to enforce uh, the restrictive covenants. Um, interestingly, the interim injunction was granted. Um, so that's the that's the sort of immediate urgent application that an employer can make if they think um, that an, an individual is about to breach their post termination restrictions and it's all hands on deck and you have to you know go to court very very quickly um, and explain why you think um, there's going to be a breach and why you think there has to be a stop placed on that um, so they must have satisfied the court at that stage that there was there was enough evidence that she was planning on um, working for a competitor and breaching her covenants Interestingly, the, um, the evidence that they laid was quite compelling. So she'd scanned on to her personal computer lists of clients and confidential information. Um, she had also failed to give her new employer, let's just call it employer for the sake of it, a copy of her contract of employment, which included, you know, that express clause that says you're under restrictive covenants and you're under an obligation to give any future employer a copy of that to, to make them aware that you're under restrictive covenants. Um, and she had also contacted um, clients um, during her garden leave period. So I think, you know, the court, in fairness to them at the interim hearing, would have been satisfied that there was a definite risk here um, of the um, of the, the covenants being breached. It went to a full trial um, a number of months later to decide what, what the damages um, should be ultimately and if that interim decision should be upheld. And interestingly, when they analysed the restrictive covenants at that stage, what they said was um, they were void um, they were um, they were not lawful at all. And they looked at the particular circumstances of the case here. Um, they looked at the non-compete and they said nine months is very long time. It's a very broad non-compete. Um, so it's effectively stopping her from working for any company which um, undertook competitive or business that was competitive with her old employer. Um, and in particular, what they looked at was the fact that the employer, when they'd taken on this individual, had given them a probationary period with two weeks notice. So they said, although that's not always 
fully determinative, that gives you an impression of how crucial to the business that employer views that employee. So in a nutshell, what they're saying is if we can risk this person going on two weeks notice, um, then how can we say that they're so crucial and they have such sway um, that they need to be stopped from working for a competitor for nine months? Um, also, what, what I thought was really quite interesting was the um, the MD of the business was only on a six month non-compete, I think because that had been an older version of the contract. So again, it's that disparity between, you know, a more junior employee being put on that um, very onerous set of terms. Um, they also felt that they hadn't narrowed the scope of the non-dealing with clients. Um, they hadn't um, they hadn't looked at this individual's particular role. Now, she had actually been taken on to um, effectively uh, work the book of clients of an outgoing retiring advisor. So it would have been really easy for them to say, these are the clients that you've been brought on to deal with and these are the clients that you cannot get in touch with and, and seek to solicit or deal with. But instead, what they said was any client of um, the business that has been a client um, of anyone at any time going back 18 months with whom you have had um, contact during your employment. So the example they used was there could have been a client that had come on board, you know, a year before she had joined the business and she could have had one interaction with that client and she would have been prevented um, from dealing with that client um, in, in her new job. So they just felt that was that was too much. And, and the final point that I wanted to flag on this was that 18 month backstop period. So, you know, there's the sort of forward period that we talk about. So how long do you want the restrictive covenant to last? Is it going to be six months, nine months, one year after termination? But then there's the the backwards looking period, which is usually um, between six and 12 months where we see any any client with whom, whom you've had personal or material dealings in the six months prior to your employment coming to an end or the 12 months prior. Now they use an 18 month backstop um, and that is, as the court found, extremely um, far in its reach um, and, and would really mean, I think, from the court's point of view that effectively anyone that she dealt with um, in her very short tenure <laughs> at that business would have been off limits. They weren't sat completely satisfied that the, the business aims there um, were being protected and, you know, were, that they weren't going further than they needed to to protect the business aims. So I guess restrictive covenant cases are quite hard because it will always turn on the facts. And these were quite specific, actually, in this particular case, but it's more just to, to keep that on your radar. You know, you may get pressure um, to just get the contracts out and, and get it signed. And especially when there's, you know, harmony at the start or um, people are all um, on good terms at the start of new employment and then it all goes wrong at the end. Just make sure that you're, you're really questioning managers and, you know, having a think yourself about are there any other ways that we can narrow this? Do we really need them to be this long? And one thing that I think came out from that case is if you're going to put in probationary periods, could you potentially have a sort of um, a graduating scale of restrictive covenants? So, for example, for the first year of employment, could you have three months post termination restrictions and then after a year when the individual has embedded themselves within the business and it created those relationships with clients that's maybe the point where you're thinking right we really need um six months nine months one year um at, by way of non-solicitation or non-dealing so an in, interesting case and um a, another kind of practical word of caution on restrictive covenants jen we've got a question and i wondered if you you knew this from reading the case but was there any issue with the employee taking the information, i.e. was there any consideration of her being reported to the ICO? That may not have been in it. Yeah, they didn't mention anything about the ICO, but what they did say was they were satisfied she'd breached her contract. So um, that that was certainly a contractual obligation um, 
express in relation to confidential information and implied in terms of your your general duties to your employer um, to act in good faith and um, and loyalty. So there there was a finding um, at the High Court that there had been a breach of contract in relation to those provisions. Now, what they'd need to do is then demonstrate that they had suffered losses as a result of, mm -hmm. of those breaches. But yeah, I mean, it, it was obviously um, it was obviously pretty clear cut that she'd acted inappropriately. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's an angle I've seen taken where there isn't restrictive covenants or we've been concerned about the validity of the restrictive covenants that we've taken an approach of data theft per se and breach of confidentiality. And that's something obviously Rebecca's uh, team and the dispute resolution, resolution team have been very good at uh, advising on. And in relation to that, there can be potential criminal sanctions as well against the employee, which can often stop them in their tracks. I mean, one thing that I was thinking, I can understand the court's view in, in terms of their concerns about the scope of that restrictive covenant. And I think, you know, the fact that the MD was on a period that was less and the fact that she'd been brought in to work on specific projects where it was clear to the clients where. But the bit that probably gives me the most concern, and I wondered if you think this point may be appealed, is the idea that, you know, a lot of employees or a lot of employers, the standard will have a probation period. And you would have thought, well, you know, a lot of the issue about people stealing the the, the information and the confidential information is, is they build it up over time. So it's still feasible or understandable that, you know, if they've only been in the door for three months, they may not have really got enough traction to cause you damage, um, hence a probationary period. So I'm really interested to see how that pans out in the in the court's thinking in the future, because it's obviously something that we would need to, to consider in terms of senior contracts. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, sometimes though, if you are at the level where you're being put on these hefty post-termination restrictions, either you would negotiate as the employee out of a probationary period wouldn't you and you'd be straight into the, the lengthy notice period or the employer would be saying we can't risk um a, an early exit but yeah i thought that was i thought that was really interesting and i have to say i've never seen that sort of graduated approach um to duration of restrictive covenants i also have to mention and I don't know if anyone else has seen it I saw my first um restrictive covenant in the UK drafted on the basis that you would be paid a percentage of your salary post termination um for the um for the period of the restrictive covenant which is something that um it hasn't been common at all in in the UK but I think we're in other jurisdictions, there's that uh, that sense of we have to keep that individual out the market. And um, if you if you do make a sort of continuing payment, the employment has ended, but you're making an, a payment equivalent to what their pay would have been, and um, then you're much more likely to have uh, an enforceable covenant at that stage. So I uh, I don't know. I wonder if um, if restrictive covenants are going to become more important um, for businesses if employers will start focusing again on how they they get enforceability um as tight as it can be have and you seen that before perhaps Pardon? yeah i mean ironically more european now we exit yeah yeah <laughs> because it's a very it's a very sort of scandinavian i mean that's been around in, in the scandinavian countries for years and, and some of the other jurisdictions as well that it is standard to mm -hmm. if you want a restrictive covenant you pay for it yeah um, yeah interesting uh, so yeah and sorry mandy i'm eating into your time but this last case is just really brief um but quite interesting and you mentioned on the european point so um any of you who have been involved in an interim relief hearing will probably be be scarred for life because it's a little bit like an interim um injunction and it is terrifying because effectively what that involves is where an individual um, is is dismissed and they say it's for a specific reason, usually whistleblowing. Um, they can put on their claim form that they're claiming interim relief. Um, they need to get it in seven days after um, their employment comes to an end. 
And then that's fast tracked into what's called an interim relief hearing, um, where the employment tribunal will decide whether or not their case has sort of merit on the face of it, if they're likely to succeed. If they find that's the case, then they're put back in employment until the full hearing. So it's it's pretty high stakes. I have to say, well, I'm touching wood, <laughs> very rarely happens. It's obviously great tactically if you are acting for an employee because my goodness, what an amount of pressure you're putting on a business there. Um, if the business has decided to let you go, wouldn't want you to darken their door again. And then you're faced with a hearing um, at which an employment tribunal could say that person needs to be re-employed until we get to the, the final hearing. Um, but so this case um, was really interesting. It concerned an individual who had made sexual harassment allegations against her employer. Sorry, let me tell you the name. That would probably be helpful. Steer against Stormshore Limited. Um, and yeah, so she'd made sexual harassment allegations and then she felt she had been victimised as a result of that. She'd asked to work from home. Um, they reluctantly agreed, but then they, they cut her hours and started requiring her to have like monitoring um, technology um, so that she uh, so that they could monitor her working. Anyway, she made an interim relief application as part of her discrimination claim and the employment tribunal said, uh, access denied because there's no jurisdiction. You can't have interim relief hearings for discrimination claims, only for whistleblowing some other um, types of claims. Um, and they appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal on the basis that that sort of barrier, so not allowing interim relief, was incompatible with European law um, and the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and very interestingly, what the Employment Appeal Tribunal said was it's not incompatible with EU law, um, but it is on the face of it incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, what the Employment Appeal Tribunal cannot do, though, is issue a declaration of incompatibility. And even more than that, they can't say we're rewriting the Equality Act and adding in an, an ability for someone to bring an interim relief hearing. But what they did do was they said you're, you're being given permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal have the power to issue that declaration of incompatibility. Um, and if they do so, then really the government will have to deal with that and will, will very likely have to legislate to allow for interim relief. Um, for discrimination claims and Brexit does not um, change that because uh, as part of the um, post-Brexit agreement uh, the UK has committed to remain a, a member and a signatory of the European Convention on Human Rights. So I think that is you know it's a technical point and it's not something that's changed at the moment but I think that could be a bit of a game changer if that goes through at court of appeal level um, because Obviously, we see a lot of discrimination claims attached to dismissals, don't we? And so if employees started applying for interim relief as part of their claim, I think that could really cause um, significant challenges for employers. So that's a bit of a watch this space. But I think the EAT was extremely clear in their analysis. There was an incompatibility. So um, it would take a complete U-turn on the part of the Court of Appeal um, to change the direction of travel on that one. So with apologies, Mandy, for going over, that's that's be done. Not at all, Jen. You may have mentioned this because I was typing because there was another question on the restrictive covenants that I've, I've typed and someone had suggested would uh, the way forward be just using garden leave. And I think certainly, obviously, that is akin to, to what, what you were seeing. Um, did you mention on the interim relief applications, the, the downside is the fact that, you know, um, if the application is successful, and it's usually at the, the beginning of the dismissal, so they're raised usually within 14 to three days to 21 days after the actual dismissal is affected, the employee's salary is preserved and that is not repaid, even mm -hmm. if they ultimately lose their case. So it's preserved until a full hearing takes place. Sorry, you may have, did you mention that? No, 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 I didn't. Right, okay. 
So I didn't actually know that, Mandy. Yeah, I, I've been in a, a couple of interim relief hearings and you do really feel <laughs> the pressure of, of such a hearing um, because the standard of, of proof that is required for that interim relief application to be established is not the same standard if you were in a full hearing and, and nor is all the evidence before the judge. It is an emergency hearing. It is an interim application after all, but the advantage is to the employee in terms of leverage is that they get their salary preserved and you know you can see in negotiation they will kick the hearing out the full hearing out because even win or lose they do not have to pay that back hence why it is a tactic often used by the most senior executives uh, of organizations who are on high salaries to make sure that they're not prejudiced so it is it is a scary <laughs> It is a scary remedy and one which if it was extended beyond whistleblowing, so it can only be used that obviously the whistleblowing in the trade union arena um, could be quite quite prejudicial to employers. So um, I used to have a colleague um, when I worked in London who anytime she either got an interim injunction um, or an interim relief application used to run down the corridor saying I've got an interim injunction I've got an interim relief hearing and I used to think she's really intense but now having heard what you said I can understand why yeah yeah I, I was I, because, yeah many years ago I was uh, pleading a case on Christmas Eve for that and uh, thankfully uh, managed to get the employer out of hot water it was going to be a very expensive new year yeah. um, and on that note uh, looking forward to the new year and, and what's in the news well obviously um, it would be remiss of us not to touch on Brexit um, and that you know the Christmas gift for us was the the UK and the EU had at long last reached a trade and cooperation agreement on Christmas Eve this year or 2020 before the end of the transition period and the commitment for that was that uh, a level playing field of commitments which cover employment rights means that the UK would not weaken or reduce the level of employment rights in place as at the 31st of December. So it's not a complete prohibition, but there was a general view that we wouldn't uh, deviate from current protections. Now, the government have now subsequently announced that they will undertake a review of workers' rights in the UK, so that perhaps could cover, cause us some cause for concern. A lot of people are saying that's a case of tilting at windmills. I had to look up what that meant, but basically it means that it's an imaginary beast and there's no reason to be looking at these rights because everything should just stay the same. However, if you look at those that are involved in the review, you may have seen that uh, a lot of them had been instrumental in suggesting that, you know, working time regulations, et cetera, uh, were hindering uh, progression in, in business. So, you know, obviously the UK, uh, back when uh, these regulations came into place, went for the opt-out and not just an opt-out for, for various sectors or job roles, but across the board so that, you know, uh, they, you could persuade your employees to opt out of the 48-hour limit. So there's very much a feeling that things like that will be looked at and perhaps the limit will be removed. The case law that we saw around holiday pay, for instance, being calculated or included in overtime uh, or so rather overtime being calculated in holiday pay may also be looked at um, other pieces of legislation which um, have you know there's been some speculation include to pay for them to be more business friendly so perhaps relaxing the consultation provisions and giving employers more freedom to harmonize post transfer um, the agency worker regulations are likely to come under review because these have have been unpopular and quite complex. Um, collective redundancy, there's been calls to increase the numbers uh, affected in terms of the, the groupings. Um, I think we've already mentioned holiday pay and of course discrimination as, as Jen was picking up on an interim relief applications, but the idea of uncapped awards 
and discrimination claims is a European concept. And at the moment, obviously, in the UK, we have statutory caps on the amount of compensation employees can be awarded for unfair dismissal claims, but not discrimination claims. Um, and that, again, is something that, that we may see eroded uh, once following the government's review. So these are the areas that you might see change. So also, uh, December was busy. We also saw that the ICO um, published a blog for our Christmas reading on the 18th of December, highlighting the risks of implementing logarithms for hiring purposes. Now, I thought this was quite interesting. It seems to be like our, uh, <laughs> our, our, our version of psychometric testing and how that was received when they first came out and, and the challenges around that. Now, the ICO had observed a potential increase by employers in using these, firstly, to ease the burden on HR departments, which, who were, which were perhaps struggling because of the COVID pandemic. But secondly, a belief that if you removed human interference, then you could remove bias. However, they've identified that far from eliminating discriminatory practices, I mean, after all, the data has to be plugged in by a human, the prejudice was the prejudices will remain, but sadly, without the concept of fairness built in. So you can't actually plug this a sort of overriding discretionary element or human element into into these calculations. So as a result of that, um, the ICO are advising employers to assess as part of a data protection assessment, DPIA, whether using algorithms is a necessary and proportionate solution to a problem. So using that test that we see on discrimination issues. So is it is it a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim? Why are you using it and do you think it will help? Where it's deemed that they could be useful in your organisation, also as part of a, a data protection impact assessment, employers must determine and document how they will sufficiently mitigate bias and discrimination and put in place appropriate safeguards and technical measures to achieve this. So I think the final word is, is that automated decisions in themselves will not comply with GDPR. Um, and also you need to be wary that you know just using these mechanisms will not necessarily apply with equality law without further consideration. So the next thing I wanted to highlight, and uh, you may have missed this uh, as, as we approached Christmas, but on the last day of 2020, or rather as we approached the new year, I should say, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy named and shamed 139 employers who had collectively failed to pay 6.7 million to over 95,000 workers between September 2016 and July 2018. So they may have thought that they were going to get away with the name and shame publication and or it would be lost in the news around COVID, but um, they weren't getting away with it so easily. So I hope none of you were affected by that. But while the arrears and hefty penalties of up to 200% of arrears capped at £10,000 per worker were paid by these employers, this did not save them from the bad publicity. So it is a bit of a double whammy. And it, it's concerning to note that two of the main causes of breaches were low paid workers being made to cover work related costs, such as paying for uniform training or parking fees. And employers failing to raise workers pay after they had a birthday, which should have moved them into a different national minimum wage bracket. As you can see, these breaches could easily have been unintentional but stressing the importance of regular audits, particularly where you may employ a high proportion of casual workers with rolled up holiday pay. So I think things like casual workers where you know you might have spikes in their pay and then lower pay, but it's all usually calculated over a rough average period. Um, you need to be alive to how, whether or not on average, the, NW, the NMW is being complied with. So turning now to the issue of harassment, this is something which I know has come up on a few of our webinars and you've been acutely aware of the concept of harassment in a virtual world. And rather than necessarily eliminating things like sexual harassment because we're not in the workplace, 
we're perhaps seeing a new dimension to it. And the charity Rights of Women has called for the government to strengthen the Equality and Human Rights Commission's guidance on sexual harassment at work and to make it statutory. In doing so, they have highlighted that video calling has eroded privacy and safety by bringing harassers into their victims' home environment, including their bedrooms. It also reports that victims have felt less able to report harassment to their employers while working remotely. For women who did raise concerns, 29% felt that their employer's response had been negatively impacted by the COVID pandemic, with some seeing investigations delayed because of lockdown restrictions. So obviously, rather than these issues being addressed, they feel that they're, they're not being addressed because of COVID. So again, something that I think we're going to see more of. Last but not least, I thought I would just mention increases uh, in the year ahead. So you'll all be aware that from 4th of April, we usually see new laws coming out and we also see uh, the annual increase to, to some of our statutory payments. And it's expected uh, that the weekly rate of statutory sick pay will increase by a hefty £1.50, taking it up to £96.35 a week. And the weekly rate for SMP and other statutory allowances, so that includes like shared uh, parental leave and adoption leave, will be increased by a meagre 77 pence and up to 151 pounds 97 pence. So that really brings us to a conclusion on time and place to say. Um, I think we've answered all the questions that have been raised. Jen, is there anything else that you've picked up on? Nope, I think that's not semantic. Good, good to go. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, if there's anything else um, that you would like to discuss from the topics today, please feel free to get in touch with any of the speakers or your usual contact at, at Barnes. Um, we will also be circulating the video and also a note of what we've discussed today with some further information on uh, some statutory changes to look out for. And that just leaves me to all say happy Australia Day. So I hope you all have some shrimp lined up for your cold barbecues and uh, see you all next time. Thanks. Bye bye.